This is a New York Glitch production. Hello everyone, I'm your host, Heather Ashley, and welcome to another episode of Women of Her Story, a podcast dedicated to celebrating women who have made or are making their mark on our society. Next to me today, I have highlighter enthusiast, Bic Brightlighter. How you doing, Bic? It's the boss applesauce himself doing well. How are you doing today? <laughs> doing good. You ready for another episode? Born ready. Born ready. Well, today's Her Story lesson is about Gertrude Bell. She may sound familiar. She did to me when I started researching, but I couldn't quite put my finger on who she was or what she had done. Born in England on July 14, 1868, to wealthy parents Sir Thomas Hugh Bell and Mary Bell. Her grandfather was Sir Isaac Lothian Bell, and he worked alongside Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli in Parliament. Mm, okay. Mm, she's getting a different start a than a lot of our like than that. a lot of our people. Yeah. I'm gonna change my name to Sir. <laughs> my first name. Your first name. Yeah. Oh. Sir. Yes, that is. That's me. Well, sad things right now are about to happen because Mary died when Gertrude was just three years old in 1871 while giving birth to her younger brother, Maurice. That's sad. Yeah, I know. Her father remarried a few years later to Florence Bell. She was deeply connected to her father and close to her stepmother, calling her mother. So that's good. I'm glad they had that nice of a relationship. Yeah. Yeah, she had a pretty standard upbringing in England for the time and in her social class. When it came time for Gertrude to head off to Oxford, she was initially filled with dread. She said that she didn't want to wake up on a cold morning in a tiny town in a tiny bed that wasn't her own, which I can understand that. The tide shifted quickly when she actually got there. She was outspoken, and she was known to have disputes with her professors. One such verbal encounter was that um, was about the position of a German town. Her professor stated that it was on the left side of the river, and she exclaimed, I'm so sorry, but it's on the right. I've been there. Wow. <laughs> She's strong-willed. I so, love her. Listen, I, I understand like, where you're coming from, but that's not but that's the right place wrong, wherever you're I've coming from. There. Geographically, you're coming from the wrong place. <laughs> Proximity-wise, you are incorrect. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Graduating with honors from Oxford in 1892, she was the first woman to win a first-class degree in modern history. She graduated first among the history majors. Okay. I know. Okay. She's smart. Boss lady. (laughs) She's she's very driven. When Gertrude (laughs) left school, she wasn't exactly desirable in the marriage market. Not that she wanted to be, though. I mean, yeah. They said she was to, quote, Oxfordy. I don't even mean, know what that's supposed to mean. She's just too smart. And she used uh, to take the London Underground and took up smoking. Oh. <laughs> she was basically like, what are all the things that society has decided that women should be to be desirable for marriage? Perfect. Gonna do the exact I'm opposite. Do the opposite Bye. of what they want. Yeah. yeah. Good. <laughs> that's ridiculous. Too Oxfordy. Yeah. Isn't Isn't that insane? Ugh. Shortly after her graduation, she went to Tehran, Iran, to visit her uncle in the May of 1892. Her uncle, Sir Frank, was a British (laughs) minister in the government. This trip sparked her interest in the Middle East, so much so that she started to learn Persian. Oh, wow. Yeah. On this trip, she met a gentleman, Henry Kadokan. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. He was bankrupt, but a lovely man. Okay, so she bankrolled for him. <laughs> Basically. She was like, I'm going to be your sugar mom. <laughs> he was like, all right, I like that. Their whirlwind romance resulted in a brief engagement that ultimately didn't work out. They were ordered to stop seeing one another, and so she returned to England. They were ordered to yeah. stop seeing one another? Yeah, a- by, by her family. Their government. Man, they can say that's like the you worst don't want to have an official of, decree yeah. It'd be like you hair fall <laughs> no longer be seeing my child <laughs> <laughs> a 
they were ordered <laughs> to stop seeing one another. She returned to England. Oh, man, we keep laughing and then a sad bomb drops because he died in Persia nine months later from oh, a brief illness. He was my, he was my he was favorite male brain. character in yeah. the story. <laughs> well, he's gone. Killed him off. Oh, well, it's her story anyway. I'm sorry. <laughs> Gertrude began exploring Europe with a specific desire to venture through the Alps. One such adventure found her caught in a blizzard for 53 hours, hanging on a rope on the unclimbed northeast face of the, this mountain. That's really hard for me to say. Finsterarhorn. Finsterarhorn. Sure. In 1902. While this was an amazing and exciting adventure, something kept pulling Gertrude back to the Middle East. On her return, she first visited Palestine and then Syria. Gertrude had a career as a writer, traveler, and archaeologist. Her writings informed the British people about the remote parts of the empire. Although people seem to have not been able to absorb any information other than the fact that a woman had written and provided the information. Oh, damn it. Yeah. She... I was just hoping that her opinion, that what she wrote down wasn't biased just because she might have been like royalty, but I don't think no. she, it would have been. No, uh, now I'm just not. bitter that no yeah. one would take her seriously because she was of uh, so, female gender. So listen to this. That's ridiculous. She said this. Um, she, she wrote a lot of letters back and forth to a lot of people. So this is um, an excerpt from something where she said, I just got mother's letter of December the 15th saying there's a fandango about my report on the civil administration in Mesopotamia. The general line taken by the press seems to be that it's most remarkable that a dog should be able to stand up on its hind, hind legs at all, <laughs> i.e. a female write a white paper. Oh. I hope they'll drop that sort of line and pay attention to the report itself if it will help them to understand what Mesopotamia is like. I like to think that she wrote it in your in the tone that you just said that. Oh, she absolutely... There's no way she did it. Because that was very fierce, and I like to think that... That was... That was. The fact that she was like, seems like they... Y'all had the audacity to... No, no. <laughs> she's... Oh, my gosh. But, no, it's ridiculous. She's like, okay, what, are you saying, like, a... Women can write? <gasps> Yeah, it's, she was in... She, Preposterous. I know. <laughs> in 1914, Bell made a treacherous journey to... It's H-A apostrophe I-L. Ha'il sounds right. Guys, I'm sorry. I tried. It was a small town in Northern Arabia. Some reports have the trip taking as long as three months. She was the second woman to visit this remote area. She writes that there was a war all around them, and murder is like spilled milk around the area. Upon her initial arrival, she and her caravan were held inside the walls of the town and told that not only would she not be getting her money that they had confiscated back, but that she wouldn't be allowed to leave. She spent the next few days in solitary confinement. Then seemingly, out of nowhere, someone appeared one evening with a bag of gold and told her she could leave. Just I know, like that? Just, I think somebody like let her escape. Are you about I to tell me how they know him? How they know her? No. Okay. I'm not. Then I'm very, we don't then know. I don't know. Then we have no idea. Who, yeah. That's nice of them. Her journey further into Arabia was cut short, however. Archduke Ferdinand was assassinated in the summer of 1914. Oh, bad timing. Yeah. In the two decades leading up to World War I, Bell had already written and published numerous books. And her letters and correspondence were later collected and compiled and published. So back to World War I. During the war, Gertrude initially worked for the Red Cross in France. This didn't exactly suit her, and she felt she was be of better use in the Middle East. She did speak fluent Arabic and Persian at this time. She joined a British intelligence unit in Cairo, Egypt, known as the Arab Bureau. Here, she collaborated with famous British traveler T.E. Lawrence. <laughs> oh, and he was like, I'm writing. That's it. That's all he said. What? They just collaborated. No, I know. <laughs> what he was writing, right? He was he... Obviously. He's yeah. a famous British traveler and writer. I know. <laughs> famous I can't say famous British. It's hard. Hey, I said it that time. Yeah, that's rude, bro. <laughs> her writing about her experience in the Middle East, particularly Iraq, are still studied and referenced by policy experts. During her extensive travels in the Middle East, she had created a map of the tribes who ran them their type of governing, and more. When British forces captured Baghdad in 1917, Gertrude was called to help with some of the next steps. 
she became a powerful official of the British administration. She was to communicate with tribal sheiks and messengers, gather and sort information, create a new and more detailed tribal map, and give them a rundown of Baghdad personalities. That's cool that she was able to She's, be a translator yeah. and a cartographer. Oh my god, yeah. Right? What? <laughs> like, what? Well, I'm going to give you a layout of all the sand and the... And the... And the rocks and mountains, and then and these also, people live here. I'll talk to them for And you. these people are here, and I know what guns they smuggle here. Yeah, she's cool. Yeah, she had a gift for knowing what you wanted to say and understanding your point of view. No one else had the in-depth knowledge of the ins and outs of the tribal loyalties. Bell was intent on making sure the Arab state was founded from three Ottoman provinces, Mosul, Baghdad, and Basra. And further, she had advocated for there to be an Arab ruler. She was concerned about the approach that was being taken in implementing a new government. London made promises of freedom to persuade Arabs to rise against the Turks, and India wanted imperial possession at the head of the Persian Gulf. So, the League of Nations mandate was born. Iraq resented it entirely, and Gertrude wrote of her concerns. She said, No people likes permanently to be governed by another. I hope that the transition from British to native rule will be made peacefully, for A.T. Wilson seems to be taking a rather definite anti-Arab line. I send you a letter from General Clayton because it seems to echo our thought. Burn it when you've read it. So (laughs) here is the letter from General Clayton. Dear Gertrude, I think you are in for difficulties with Mesopotamia. I hope that the British hand will be a light one to start with, even at the cost of some efficiency, and that the local national aspirations will not be snubbed too ruthlessly. I feel that we should start slowly and let the people come to us for help and guidance rather than impose Western efficiencies too suddenly on Orientals to whom it had been unknown for centuries. I fear that catchword, British efficiency... You, I know, will realize what I mean. Um, no. I call shenanigans. That's ridiculous. The British Empire. Like, no, I know. Oh, the way that the yeah. British are approaching it. Yeah, it's like... It doesn't make sense. when It, it, it doesn't make sense for the uh, the way that they went about it. Just, ugh. And, and they, people expressing concern the whole time. The people who know these people. You know, they're like, I know this culture. I know these people. And this is not going to work. You need to do it at, in a way that might be less efficient, quote unquote, but that's More, not the point of it's this. Not, it's not diplomatic. It's very one-sided. But, yeah. I mean, World War One was also yeah. a very crazy yeah. time. Well, so. she also stated that, quote, We rushed into this business with our usual disregard from a comprehensive political scheme. Can you persuade people to join your side when you're not sure in the end whether you'll be there to take theirs? That's so real in all of... Oh. We're not going to, that's a whole other episode launching into all of these politics, but it didn't seem to take long for the Iraqis to take a stand. In July of 1920, Shia tribes of the Middle Euphrates rose in revolt. Hundreds of British soldiers and 8,000 Iraqis were killed before the situation was contained. I know, it's really sad. That didn't have to happen. Nope, certainly didn't. She said, it's strange to be treating all of these tragic places merely as stages of a journey. That she's like, this isn't how it should be done, but this overseer who's not here to see all of this actually happening in person is saying it's just a casualty of of war. This is just how we get, you know, to the better part of it. No. No. Yeah, there are a lot of people that lose their lives. Finally, Winston Churchill called for a conference in Cairo in 1921, and Bell was asked to be there. She was, of course, the only woman present and the only person there with firsthand knowledge of Iraq and Nedge. I know. All these people are like, no, let's implement all of these policies and this and this. And she's like, well. You've never been there. Yeah. Here, they determined boundaries of the Iraqi state and decided that they would be naming Hashmedi Prince Faisal, Faisal, sorry, who had been ousted by the French in Syria and he would become the king of Iraq. Mm hmm. This solution had a 96% yes vote in place of the previously implemented mandate. So we are making good steps. This is go. probably the direction they should have gone in the first place, but here we are. Well, that's what happens when you have like a you know a woman kind of in charge or like in place. Things get done. <laughs> Stuff happens. Yeah. 
things move. After her colleagues one by one began returning to Britain, America, and elsewhere, Belle remained in Baghdad after Faisal's rise in 1921. She now focused her attention on funding and constructing an archaeological museum. She was like, all right, politics aside, let's talk about the earth. Yeah. <laughs> She pioneered the idea of retaining antiquities in their country of origins instead of transporting them to European centers of learning. I can't believe it took till the 1920s for people to start doing this. Like, maybe let's not rip these priceless artifacts away from the countries that they actually come from and let's keep them there but preserved. No one took, no one, yeah, that's just ridiculous. Yeah. This resulted in the creation of the National Museum of Iraq. It held one of the world's largest collections of Mesopotamian antiquities. Unfortunately, it was famously damaged and ransacked in 2003 after the invasion of Iraq by the United States. Gertrude Bell's Iraq lasted for 37 years. Crude oil was found in commercial quantities in Kirkuk in 1927, and troubles really began to rise. The Iraqi monarchy survived Turkish um, intrigue, and on October 3rd, 1932, the Hashemite Kingdom of Iraq became a fully sovereign state. But Saudi aggression and repeated uprisings continued to plague the state. The collapse of British power in Suez in 1956 proved to be crippling to Faisal II, and his family were murdered in a Republican coup d'etat on July 14, 1958. As with all political moves, the British involvement and those parts of the colonization were hotly debated, some praising them and others questioning their intents. Historian David Price Jones being one of the biggest critics. He said, those who marched in European capitals to demonstrate the war were Gertrude Bell's heirs, even if they have no idea who she might have been. While this sounds like a compliment, it certainly isn't coming from him. His book, Treason of the Heart, he spends several chapters talking about English colonial Arabists of the 19th and early 20th century. Tony Curzon Price said that Jones argues that they hated their own country, romanticized the other in an absurd oriental ideal, and did their best to mess up the serious business of the pursuit of Britain's national interest in the Middle East. I disagree with the the idea that her angle was there for idealist and selfish reasons yeah you can have passion for other countries development without betraying without saying you hate your own yeah and saying that you're a traitor he's saying that because she was looking out for the middle like mesopotamia's like interest right over Britain's power meant she was a traitor when really that just makes her a good person. A good, yeah, like on this not planet. Not concerned. Not just yeah. like not selfish. And yeah. this guy's like, you have to think about number one. Mm -hmm. It's like, mm -hmm. no, man, that's how you, no, that's selfish. Mm -hmm. You can't think like that. Mm -hmm. There's a documentary, Letters from Baghdad, and it is directed by Ziva Olabam and Sabine Krayenbo. So it's narrated letters that Gertrude wrote over archive footage and a few look-alike shots i watched it it's really good and it's voiced by tilda swinton oh. so it's a really interesting it's gonna sound nice documentary sure. and this this i promise makes sense with what we were just saying about her not being um like a, a bad person and selfish in that way because i can tell you that her letters are so beautiful and they express nothing but love for Iraq and the Iraqi people. And while, yes, there are many imperfections and disasters that resulted in the way that the Middle East was handled by Britain, those things were so fully out of her hands. I think what's misconstrued is that the initial mandate that was given, people, because she was part of that process, people are saying that this is her doing and she's like no they didn't do anything that i told them to do yeah they just had me there and then said this was mine yeah yeah and she advocated for the arab ruler and she wanted desperately for that to all come to fruition and as for hating her own country there is no indication of of her having any mal intent yeah you know in in Poor, and when she was in poor health, she returned to visit with friends and family and see her home that she loved. She didn't just leave and abandon. People move countries all the time. And it's just 
so bizarre I that if, they villainized her in that way. I think if anything, it made it should have made her country look better. The fact that someone who left that country was noble and, and nice s- enough to want to help another group of people mm-hmm. who needed that assistance. I mean... Also, she was coming from a place of great wealth and power over in Britain. And when she comes to the Middle East, that nobody cares about that. I mean, she did have some political connections. But for the most part, initially, like on those journey, when she was in, in that like really remote town where she was locked up and put in solitaire it did not matter that she was of of a wealthy background you know they're just like i want to see what that i want to see what that guy did who like was talking which one um the one who uh basically said that oh that saying that she was bad yeah the i want to like what what did he do for her for, for him for the country and for his people exactly and like he's going to like point the finger at her and like say that armchair she, critic like are you kidding me yeah, yeah. dude like yeah. you probably just uh, no like there's yeah there's no respect for people like that if yeah. you're gonna talk trash about another person for doing you know, for trying to help another country mm-hmm. and making your country look better. W- w- what's your track record yeah. like? Yeah. You can't talk smack. No. Like, yeah. Yeah. Do something for your people and then, you know, yeah. maybe and try then... to compare it, but <laughs> don't because those are both, just, she's trying to do something that helps. It's yeah. not like, you know, she's trying to hurt the country. Yeah. And exactly. The people and in turn your people. She's only doing good. She's yeah. not being jealous. Yeah. You're just, you, you know what it is? It's clout. He was clout chasing. He's oh. like, oh, like, you know, she's doing this over there. So like, I'm going to criticize her and yeah. make myself look better. Mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Trying to get that attention. Mm-hmm. Well, something I, <laughs> something I came across that really surprised me considering her political standings and her own experiences is that she actually opposed women's suffrage in Britain. She felt like a vast majority of her contemporaries lacked education and knowledge of the world. And I would posture that that is because of their social and financial standing. Women weren't allowed to, or at the very least, were discouraged from, from being educated at this point. And she was very lucky that she was in such a position that it, it was expected what a what an interesting level of privilege that 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 she's coming from where she's like I don't think that they were like really they really wanted her they were really like deserving of it or that they you know they wanted to be free and it's I, like they, maybe they didn't know about it maybe they just didn't you know like yeah it's not that well it's interesting they didn't want it. I do think I do think yeah I think it's that it's a privileged place kind of. Yeah, well, in Britain, just because, I mean, think about that time, and there, th- women aren't being educated, and so she's one of the few that is, and I do think she is seeing that, and so I think she might be coming from a place of, Perfect. not that she hates other women, I'm saying that she's coming from a place of, like, they're not being educated, so I don't want them voting if they can't be educated. And it is coming from a place of privilege, but it's also coming from a place of, she's like, I only want educated people to vote, and it's like, well, yeah, but, like, also... Uh, it's so weird yeah it's so weird yeah (laughs) she wasn't particularly uh liked on a personal level Mm. in london or new delhi (laughs) found her arrogant abrupt and judgmental (laughs) those who knew her though knew that that wasn't the only side of her they saw her softness her kindness generosity and dedication she's just one of those where you gotta like Tough exterior, tough interior, and there's like a maybe tiny little soft ooey gooey center, Mm -hmm. like way in there. You got to get through the burnt side first. Mm. Yeah. Yummy. Yeah. Worth it. Not always great. Mm. (laughs) Well, tragically, on July 12th, 1926, after suffering from persistent health problems, including depression and the recent death of her brother, Gertrude passed by taking a fatal overdose of sleeping pills. She said... Quote, to be idle is to have time to think, and no thoughts are bearable. I am not a person. I think the best measure of how her presence was received in the Middle East should be measured by how the people felt about her. In the Baghdad Times, they published an obituary for her, an excerpt saying she was the friend of hundreds in Iraq, but above all, she was the friend and champion of Iraq itself. I mentioned the documentary earlier, and I really can't recommend it enough. It's beautiful and sad, but so well done. You may be familiar with Werner Herzog's Queen of the Desert, starring Nicole Kidman, Robert Pattinson, and James Franco. 
It was first shown at the British International Film Festival in February of 2015, and uh, it's about her life, sort of. I mean, it's obviously um, a Hollywood version of it, but it's it's, it's really good. I was going to say, I wonder who they get to play the Persian guy. Probably James Franco. <laughs> Hollywood it's, casting. <laughs> it's really good. And, you know, like I said, there's Hollywood drama added. So not all the events are true, but the nature of it is pretty genuine and, and true of her journey. Anything else to add? Um, no, you know, I, I'm, she, she was a tough cookie. You she know, really was. she, um, she didn't take crap from the <laughs> people that kind of denounced her and who she was but she knew who she was she knew her identity and she knew what she wanted to do and how to help the people mm -hmm. you know what i mean she didn't let those people who were talking trash about her stop her from going to help those people mm -hmm. who needed it and mm -hmm. kind of restore a little bit of the culture by bringing back the by you know uh helping them create that museum and mm -hmm. creating you know uh br restoring those artifacts from the mesopotamian like that's and Pretty I, impressive. Oh, yeah. And I think a big thing to me is when she... Um, a, a, a good way to shut down the, the butt-faced journalist who seems to be villainizing her um, is the fact that in, in Iraq, they, they posted an obituary for her mm -hmm. when she passed. Right. And they said that she was a champion for its people and the country itself. And I think that's a big way to say... No, she was obvious to to um, Price. It's just like you're you're so misguided in, in in your approach to her. And while she might not have been the friendliest and bubbliest of people, you know, I think that's that's oh, fine because who she because was. Because she didn't need to be. Yeah. You know, and was I was a helpful individual, and you know, her value was rec was recognized in other countries mm -hmm. by other people. So, mm -hmm. you know, one dissenter didn't mean anything. Mm-hmm. Keep yeah. on trucking and doing your thing. Yeah. Keep, Keep on doing, doing what it. you want to do. Keep doing what you love. There's always going to be someone who's going to be like, why are they doing this? But those people are just trying those to steal your clout. Those people don't get it. They want, your, they, want your, they want your energy, your good vibes, and they want your... Oh, um, yeah. They want They're what like you have. They're like energy vampires from what we do in the shadows. They are energy vampires. They suck the energy out of you yeah. so that no one's happy. And that no one's efficient and yeah. doing their thing. And everyone's discouraged. They and everyone then they're miserable. sitting there like, meep, meep, meep. Yeah. <laughs> if they're not doing anything, they suck the energy and yeah. life out of you. And then, you know, they try to bring you down like that. But no. It's I so say good. nay. I say nay. I say nay. <laughs> well, you guys, I think that about wraps things up. We do have merch. We still have some merch out there. The, the Making Her Story shirts. 20% are going to be going to the Henry Street Settlement in New York City, supporting battered women's shelters, mental institutions, daycares, all that good stuff. So really get there. Get on. The, and all, all the rest of the money just is going right back into the podcast so that we can keep bringing you guys quality content twice a week. So... Go out there and get that. Also, don't forget to rate and review the podcast. It super helps our audience grow. Tune back in this Friday for an interview with the executive pastry chef at Gabriel Cruther in New York City, Priscilla Mariani. She is a two-star Michelin pastry chef, you guys. Whoa. And we do some talking about food, obviously. I like food. I love food. Mm -hmm. Gotta have food. I'll eat at least three times. <laughs> I eat at a least day. three times a day. Uh, yeah. So tune back in on Friday for that. You can follow us on Instagram at Women of Her Story Podcast. You can also send us an email at uh, Women of Her Story Podcast at gmail.com. You got it. And until next time, be safe, stay healthy, and show the world what you're made of. Bye. <laughs>